Um, um, so um, our next speaker in this session is Professor Yamima Ben Menachem, who is the central organizer of this conference, but we will do the thanks at the end of the session. Um, Yamima was one of my teachers, and with time I gradually discover how deep was her influence on my thought. Uh, she's one of the best critical listeners and uh, is what I like to call a real philosopher that has a worldview in which the scientific and other particular ideas are embedded and connected. Yamima wrote on a wide range of topics in the philosophy of physics and other philosophical subjects. She is especially known for her study of conventionalism, which culminated in her book, Conventionalism, Cambridge University Press 2006, a comprehensive study of this topic, including a critical examination of Poincaré's geometrical conventionalism. Her current large-scale project is an on, on causation in which she unites the insights she gained in many years of writings on a group of ideas that are often connected by free associations with causation, like determinism or necessity or locality or probability, all of them in physics and elsewhere. In her work, she showed why these are closely connected and yet conceptually significantly distinct. Today, Yamima will talk about space-time and non-locality, revisiting the epistemic approach to quantum mechanics. Please. Thank you, Oli. This talk is very much a continuation of the previous one from a different angle. I, I don't argue for a new interpretation like Daniel did. I want to do a, a survey, uh, a, not exactly a history, but more a survey of earlier interpretations. And uh, Einstein will come up somewhere in the talk. We're celebrating this centenary. Um, so this is my title. And uh, when I think about it uh, to myself, I'm thinking it more lighthearted is where are Ellis and Bob, um, who have already appeared in Daniel's talk. So we know that quantum mechanics is non-local, and we know that uh, it, it sanctions entangled states, and entangled states uh, manifest more correlation than allowed to by uh, classical intuitions. And uh, initially, the worry was that they allow more correlation than are allowed by the special theory of relativity, and that was a big concern. And then uh, the philosophical or the, phys the community of physicists uh, discovered that by making a distinction between um, the demand for locality and the demand for no signaling, one can have a, a, a certain amount of non-locality without violating the principle of special relativity, the principle of no signaling. I think this is a very deep conceptual distinction. We don't know, as Daniel said, we don't know exactly how it works. Um, indeterminism comes in essentially to make this distinction possible. Without it, non-locality uh, non would allow signaling. Um, but anyway, uh, there is a worry there, and there is a worry about uh, whether it violates uh, uh, other theories um, about space-time. Um, and so the question is, is quantum locality, uh, quantum non-locality, a space-time phenomena? And the answer seems obviously yes. It is a space-time phenomena. How else, if not in a certain framework uh, of space-time, wherein certain correlations are allowed and others are not allowed, can we even make sense of the notion of non-locality? And yet, this intuitive, positive answer has been challenged <coughs> Um, by a number of people, among them our late wonderful friend and colleague Itamar Pitovsky, who says, altogether in our approach there is no problem with locality, and the analysis remains intact no matter what the kinematic of the dynamic situation is. The violation of the inequality is a purely probabilistic effect. 
the derivation of Clauser-Horn inequalities is blocked since it is based on a, bo a Boolean view of, a view of probabilities as weighted averages of truth values. This, in turn, involves the metaphysical assumption that there is simultaneously a matter of fact concerning the truth values of incompatible propositions. But if one accepts that one is simply dealing with a different notion of probability, then all space-time considerations become irrelevant. And in a joint paper with Jeffrey Bubb, uh, they go on to say that the same goes for no signaling. No signaling is not specifically a relativistic constraint on superluminal signaling. It is simply a condition imposed on the marginal probabilities of events for separated systems, requiring that the marginal probabilities of a B event is independent of the particular set. This is again Alice and Bob. Uh, independent of the particular set of mutually uh, exclusive and collectively exhaustive events selected at A and conversely. Uh, now, this view that we're talking with mathematical or logical constraints, not with any physical constraints, is based on the epistemic interpretation of quantum mechanics. <coughs> and therefore, in order to deal with the question of whether non-locality is in space-time, we should look at the epistemic interpretation. And so most of my talk will be a kind of historical review of the epistemic interpretation of quantum mechanics. So these claims about non-locality and no signaling uh, are based on the uh, epistemic view. And on this view, the state function, or rays in Hilbert space, do not represent physical state of the system in reality, but rather some epistemic states of knowledge or belief or information. And this is a good start, but how are we going to end this sentence? It's fragmented, right? So we want to know knowledge or information about what? And the reason I want to look at the history of the uh, statistical interpretation is, is that exactly in how we fill in the rest of the sentence, there is a big difference between earlier attempts at an epistemic interpretation and current attempts at an epistemic interpretation. And so it seems that different epistemic interpretations share the negative claim that it's not the wave function does not represent reality, but uh, they uh, differ in what the state function still can be. So they differ on the positive part. So I want to, to begin with the early years of quantum mechanics and end with a recent PBR theorem that Carlo just brought up a few minutes ago, and I thank you for willing to postpone the discussion uh, of the theorem. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank a few people who uh, uh, helped me. So first of all, Guy Chetroni, who has uh, introduced our discussion group in philosophy of physics to the PBR theorem, and Daniel, with whom I spoke about it, at May, whom I spoke about it, and um, Bill Demopoulos, who is not here, but Roberto can tell him that in our correspondence, <coughs> his, my correspondence with him helped me to clarify things, and uh, I want to thank him too. So, realization that there is something very strange in the probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics uh, came very early. Immediately when Born suggested his probabilistic interpretation, he says, die Bewegungen Partikeln folgt Wahrscheinlichkeit gesetzen. That is, the, the motion of particles uh, obeys probability laws, the Wahrscheinlichkeit selbst, aber, but the, the probability itself, uh, um, uh, develops according to the causal principle, causal gesetz. And uh, he further says that it is, it's clear that quantum mechanics only gives answer, answers to well-posed statistical questions. And he spoke of eine 
eigenartige Verschmelzung von, von Mechanik und Statistik. Now, I, I don't know how to translate Verschmelzung, so a mixture, right? Blending. What? Blending. Blending, Blending, yeah, but it's, you know, <laughs> so Verschmelzung. <coughs> Uh, yeah, uh, so there is something strange there. And this formulation is not very different from a much more recent one that Janus gave, gave and uh, that uh, the PBR, uh, Pusey, Barrett, and Rudolf quote in their paper. Janus says, but our present quantum mechanical formalism is a peculiar mixture describing in part realities in nature, in part incomplete human information about nature, all scrambled up by Heisenberg and Bohr into an omelet that nobody has, been, uh, has seen how to unscramble. So exactly the same worry. We don't know what to do with this mixture. Um, the only difference is that James already presupposes an epistemic interpretation of probability, uh, but at this stage I don't think it was necessary to presuppose an epistemic uh, interpretation of probability, and as we will see, uh, most of the people who suggested an epistemic interpretation um, of quantum mechanics uh, did not understand probability in this subjective sense. So it, we can break up the question of what is strange about this Verschmelzung, about this mixture. We can break up the question into several questions. The first one is, what do quantum phenomena such as superposition, interference, and entanglement mean under this interpretation? It was very clear what they meant under the, the original Schrodinger interpretation, but already in, in 1926, Schrodinger realized that it couldn't be so simple. We're talking about configuration space. We're not talking about three-dimensional space, and something must be done about it. Um, and, uh, but even after a Born's interpretation where, where the original three-dimensional wave has disappeared or collapsed. Um, we're still talking about interference, right? And uh, we're still talking about entanglement. And if we're just talking about information, there is no intuitive picture uh, behind these notions. And more than that, and here again I want to mention Guy, the phase, the, the periodicity that appears in every interpretation of quantum mechanics is very intuitive from a, a realist interpretation of quantum mechanics, very unintuitive from an epistemic interpretation of quantum mechanics, and it's a project of research that uh, uh, Guy is, is uh, working on. The other question that is important is what is the status of the uncertainty principle according to the ensemble interpretation? Now here I'm using ensemble interpretation and not statistical interpretation. Uh, in the quotation from Janus, uh, uh, epistemic interpretation was just that, epistemic and subjective. But actually with a, a probabilistic interpretation, there was also the uh, 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 even more natural idea that we're talking about probabilities like in statisti statistical mechanics. We're talking about ensembles. And so if we're only talk talking about ensembles, then the laws of quantum <coughs> mechanics, such as the uncertainty principle, which is at its very center, do not apply to the individual system as Born said at the beginning, it doesn't answer questions about the individual system, and there are only laws, the uncertainty relations are about expectation values, much more general, and therefore in the individual case, if we had the means to do it, we could violate the uncertainty principles. So here, I want to mention a letter that Einstein wrote to Popper and um, uh, about this, this problem. And uh, Popper is one of the people who uh, 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 advocated a probabilistic interpretation in the sense of an ensemble interpretation, that quantum mechanics only talks about ensembles, doesn't say anything about the individual system. And he was, um, well, to me it seems a little careless about uh, all the problems that this interpretation involves. And among other things, he was 
willing to say that, of course, we can violate the uncertainty relations in the individual case. And he had an idea about how to do this, and he wrote to Einstein about it. And uh, I mentioned this letter because in the recent uh, literature, it has become common to uh, repeat Fine's claims and to say that Einstein was very dissatisfied with the, with the EPR paper, not to be confused with the PBR paper. Einstein was very unhappy with the EPR paper, and it's only the correspondence with Schrodinger that he really gave the argument as he believed it. And I think everybody repeats these claims, and they have the truth because the correspondence with Schrodinger is important. I'll return to it later. but. Um, I think in this paper to Popper, we'll see Einstein endorsing the EPR paper, endorsing even the um, notorious reality criterion that supposedly he didn't like because it was Podolsky who penned the paper and not him. Um, it's true that Popper asked, what, what is this new paper? I haven't had a chance to read it, and so Einstein summarized the paper, but he could have said, but I don't agree exactly with what we said there. But the, the, so this is one issue one reason to bring up, uh, up this, this letter. But the other reason is more important that Einstein specifically rejects Popper's uh, suggestion to violate the uncertainty relations in the individual case. And he says, you can't do that. He agrees with Popper. He says, the psi function characterizes statistic a statistical aggregate of systems rather than one single system. And he says further that this view makes it unnecessary to distinguish more particularly between pure and non-pure states. This is, so the statistics here, according to Einstein, is analogous to statistics in statistical mechanics. But he has an in principle object, objection to Popper's idea of simultaneous measurement of position and momentum of the photon. So not just to this particular suggestion, but a pri in principle, this notion came up today uh, already in other talks. And, uh, and then he describes the EPR uh, experiment. And in this particular EPR experiment, he says, we can finally show that we can violate the uncertainty relations in the individual case. So Speckens is as we've said, well, Einstein didn't uh, care about violating the uncertainty relations. This was not the rationale of the EPR paper. So here he says very clearly, one can therefore hardly avoid the conclusion that the system B has indeed a definite momentum and a definite position coordinate. So. You cannot do it in one case, you can do it in the other case. Uh, we'll go back to, the, so the first problem was super, uh, interference and the phase. Second was the uncertainty relations. The third question about the, this mixture is disturbance by measurement. Is it a physical process or is it something different. Somehow information gets lost in order to keep the limit on information that quantum mechanics um, sets. And, but we don't know anything about a physical disturbance. The fourth question, which will be very much at the center uh, uh, later on when we get to the PBR uh, uh, theorem, is about the relationship between the probabilistic description of the ensemble and the description of the individual system, which by hypothesis is not given by quantum mechanics on the statistical interpretation, on the ensemble statistical interpretation. So do we have here some kind of analogy with statistical mechanics? What happens in statistical mechanics? We have a micro level, we have a macro level, we can define all, kind, we can define all kinds of, of physical properties on the macro level. They are related to the micro level, somehow very, nat sometimes very naturally, like in, temp in the case of temperature or pressure, sometimes in a much more uh, sophisticated way, like in the case of entropy. But in any case, we have what philosophers call supervenience. So if we have a macrostate, it can be realized by many microstates. Um, 
But the reverse situation is not allowed in statistical mechanics. We cannot have a physical state at the fundamental level which is correlated with two macro states. So, per se, Orly and Mayer and multiple realizability, I think this is an example that was with us from classical statistical mechanics. And then, uh, we have two features, so, so so far we had more problems with the ensemble interpretation, but we also have two features that give it a great advantage, and one is the collapse on the, on the statistical interpretation, there is no problem, problem of collapse, it just, we have a probability function and then we make a measurement and so we know what the result was, and all of a sudden there is we, we move from uncertainty to certainty, but we don't have to worry as to how this um, transition from uncertainty to uncertainty moves in space or anything like that. So there's no problem of collapse. This is one advantage. And another advantage may be on the philosophical level, perhaps some obscure notions like duality and complementarity are also make, made redundant by the uh, statistical interpretation. And I want to stress that these questions pertain to the very meaning of quantum mechanics. We're not talking here about explanation. One of, very often hears it, hears it said that, well, we have to take quantum mechanics at, at face value. We, uh, explanations have to stop somewhere. Uh, we have to get used to non -classical, a non-classical picture of the world, etc., etc. But this is. Uh, besides the point, because the questions that we've raised so far uh, are about the meaning. Are we ascribing to an individual system a, a certain physical law like Heisenberg's uncertainty relations, or are we not doing that? So you cannot get away with saying uh, we have to accept it at face value. We don't know what the face value is at this point, right? Okay, now... Uh, the first years um, of quantum mechanics, uh, the, the ensemble interpretation was, was in the air. Um, but uh, the orthodoxy uh, denied it and thought there was something more fundamentally different here. There is no analogy with, with statistical mechanics. There is no deeper level. It's an irreducible, fundamentally radical new theory. Other people, uh, Einstein among them, objected. Um, not much progress was made. Um, ironically, uh, it is Schrodinger, who in my view is a hero of this story, and I think more than Einstein, he realized what the problems were. And so I have a, a series of um, quotes here from Schrodinger. How am I doing this time? Okay, fine. So I'll read them because I think they are uh, uh, really illuminating. This is no longer in 1926, it's 1935, and it's already a response to the einstein Podolsky paper, but uh, in the same year. Uh, but uh, see how clearly he, he sees the situation. One should note that there was no question of any time-dependent change. It would be of no help to permit the model to vary quite unclassically, perhaps to jump. Already for the single instant, things go wrong. At no moment does there exist an ensemble of classical states of the model that square with the totality of quantum mechanical statements of this moment. The same can also be said as follows. If we wish to ascribe to the model at each moment a definite state, a definite but not exactly known to me state, or to all determining parts definite, merely not exactly known to me, numerical values, then there is no supposition that to these numerical values to be imagined that would not conflict with some portion of quantum theoretical <coughs> assumptions. So it's very clear to him that it, we cannot ascribe these values. Uh, we, are, we will already run into conflict with quantum mechanics. I don't think this is something that Einstein saw. 
And consequently, Schrodinger takes the uncertainty relation to constitute neither an epistemic limitation of what can be known. In a sense, yes, epistemic interpretation, it's not, it's not uh, the best formulation. Um, I mean, you cannot violate them nor practical limitation on what we can measure or prepare. Rather, they constitute a fundamental limitation on the assignment of value to all physical magnitude at a particular moment. And accordingly, the classical notion, I thought, uh, I, well, here there is, a, it's a quote again. Accordingly, the classical notion of state becomes lost in that uh, at most a well-chosen half of a complete set of variables can be assigned definite numerical values. That's exactly the assumption that Speckens in a toy model of the epistemic interpretation uh, makes. And Schrodinger therefore goes on to rule out the possibilities that quantum probabilities and uncertainties are analogous to probabilities in statistical mechanics. And this is a huge difference between him and Einstein that we uh, sometimes ignore when we uh, lump both of them together as opposition to the Copenhagen interpretation, a huge difference uh, between them. And Schrodinger takes a psi function to represent a <coughs> maximal catalog of possible measurements, very similar to Pitofsky formulation in the paper I quoted uh, uh, from above, a bookkeeping device. It embodies the momentarily attained sum of theoretically based further expectations, somewhat as laid down in a catalog. It is a determinacy bridge between measurement and measurement. So this is as close to the <coughs> epistemic interpretation um, that one got at this early stage. And as such, he says, the implication is that upon a new measurement, the psi function undergoes a change that depends on the <coughs> measurement result obtained and so cannot be foreseen. Okay. So what follows from this regarding the, these strange correlations that we find? The maximality or completeness of the catalog, a consequence of the uncertainty relations, entails that we cannot have a more complete catalog. That is, we cannot have two psi functions of the same system, one of which is included in the other. And therefore, now it's a quote, therefore if a system changes, whether by itself or because of measurement, there must always be statements missing from the new function that were contained in the earlier ones. So we have a loss of information. I delete uh, the uh, next quote because it's more or less the same. <coughs> and now comes entanglement. This new feature also follows from the maximality or co completeness of the psi function and completeness in the sense of catalog of measurement, remember. And he argues as follows. A complete catalog for two separate systems is ipso facto, also a complete catalog of the combined system, but the reverse does not follow. Maximal knowledge, this is a quote, maximal knowledge of the total system does not necessary, necessarily include total knowledge of all its part. Not even when these are fully separate separated from each other and at the moment are not influenced and not influencing each other at all. And the reason we cannot infer such total information is that this is not a quote, is that the maximal catalog of the combined system may contain <coughs> conditional statements of the form if a measurement on the first system yields a value x, a measurement on the second will yield the value y and so on. So if the conditional statements uh, um, uh, justify the claim made before that the maximal uh, knowledge about the combined system does not entail maximal knowledge about each of the uh, <coughs> partial systems. And as you know, it was exactly the argument of the EPR that we must assume that there is somewhere, even if we don't know it, a, a possibility of knowledge about each of the system, or each of the systems should have a determinate physical state. And Schrodinger here says it's not so. So another thing that I think we ignore sometimes in the history, I don't want to blame any of you of ignoring, but I know that in the literature, uh, the thing is ignored that um, 
Schrodinger really very politely responds to the EPR argument by a very pointed critique of the EPR argument. It doesn't say so explicitly, but, but he said, he, he, actually the argument is that the EPR argument doesn't work, right? It's the e EPR argument purports to show <coughs> that correlations between the remote parts of the system, the conditional statements, entail that each individual state has a determinant value prior to measurement, and by contrast, Schrodinger argues first that such determinacy is precluded by the uncertainty relations properly understood, and second, that given his reading of the psi function as a maximal catalog of possible measurement, the indeterminacy of individual <coughs> outcomes makes perfect sense. So I think this is the best critique, better than Bohr's and better than others, of the EPR argument given at the time by a fellow opponent of the Copenhagen interpretation. And yet, Schrodinger makes it very clear that entanglement is brought about by a physical process and that it engenders the problem of consistency with the special theory <coughs> of relativity. So it, all the ingredients of a radical epistemic interpretation are there, but without the claim that, well, we can be nonchalant about space and time, it's not really a problem about space and time. So a summary of the first phase of attempts at an epistemic interpretation are that we have an ensemble, in general, an ensemble interpretation rather than a Bayesian interpretation, uh, but it really doesn't matter so much. At this point, it doesn't make a big difference that there is this analogy with statistical mechanics, that there are open questions about the uncertainty relations, and the, the big issue is that we don't have a problem with collapse. And most people who supported an ensemble interpretation went that way, and Schrodinger, who did not exactly support an ensemble interpretation, really offered us for consideration this kind of interpretation. It was looking for different things. He thought it was a problem for quantum mechanics, that this is a corner it pushes itself into, but at least he, he saw the corner. <coughs> okay. So over the years, where did the picture change and why did I say that in one sense um, an epistemic interpretation is perhaps vindicated in another sense, it is ruled out. So there are various no-go theorems, and I didn't mention all of them here, and the most famous one, of course, is a family, it's Bell, Bell's own theorem and the family of um, related uh, theorems. And I won't talk, talk about those, they are familiar, and uh, Daniel has also mentioned them, but in any way, uh, I think they have settled the problem that I mentioned about the uncertainty relations. You cannot think that the uncertainty relations are just about expectations values. The statistics uh, makes it much more reasonable to assume that uh, together with locality, um, you cannot ascribe definite values to uh, um, conjugate uh, uh, observables. Um, and uh, even, even uh, perhaps more directly, the Caution and Specker theorem um, doesn't give it a, a statistical treatment at all. You, you directly deal with, with uh, values of the individual system, uh, and it comes from a Gleason theorem where also we're not talking about statistics, we're talking of the ascription of values. So these no-go theorems, I think, have settled the problem uh, of um, uh, the uncertainty relations against an ensemble interpretation of quantum mechanics. And now comes the PBR theorem, and this is supposed to have set the, the death blow right to an epistemic interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's a recent theorem of uh, two or three years ago. Um, <coughs> And uh, I, I want to ask whether this is uh, indeed so. And so uh, um, the PBR theorem is built on an analysis of the situation, a very clear analysis given by Harrigan and Speckens, and they uh, uh, distinguish between psi-ontic models of quantum mechanics, 
where the psi function corresponds to <coughs> the physical state of the system, or is a function of it, stands in a functional relation to the physical state of the system, and psi epistemic models where psi represents knowledge about the system. And about the system is crucial. Remember the sentence at the beginning, knowledge and information about what? About Okay, so psi-ontic models can be complete or incomplete. They are complete if uh, the psi function represents the physical state completely, and otherwise they are incomplete. If they are incomplete, or, or, and in the latter case, it is conceivable that one can supplement the psi function. If it is incomplete, then we have the same situation as in statistical mechanics. We have the psi function like the macro state, and we have many a microstate that can correspond with it, and according to the psi-ontic state, you can have many lambdas that distinguish um, the, the fundamental, the states on the fundamental level, and still be represented by one psi function uh, on the quantum level. And in that case, it is conceivable that one can, can supplement the psi function with further parameters, hidden variables, as they are called, and it is thus conceivable that the same psi function corresponds to more than one physical state of the system distinguished or distinguishable by means of the values of the addition, additional hidden variables. Um, now, psi epistemic models can also be complete or incomplete. It turns out that it's the limited quantum uh, mechanics sets to completing uh, epistemic models are, are apparently much more severe, and it's not so easy to invent uh, uh, theories that violate them as uh, uh, to complete quantum mechanics on the ontic level. And um, uh, the idea behind epistemic models or the criterion for it is that if uh, the psi function is epistemic, then it can stand in a non-functional relation to the physical state of the system. That is, two different non-identical but not orthogonal functions can correspond to the same physical state. And this is the criterion that they suggest. If we really have an epistemic interpretation of quantum mechanics, then it is conceivable that two different psi functions uh, correspond to the same physical state of the system. This is the analysis of uh, Harrigan and Speckens, and this is the criterion that they suggest. So, in a psi-ontic model, we have psi uh, uh, and lambda. Lambda is the, the real state of the system corresponding. We can also have a situation where psi represents the physical state, but it's not a complete representation, so there are states that we can distinguish, lambda, lambda, one, etc. cetera. Um, and then in the case that we have an epistemic interpretation or epistemic model, we have two psi functions representing corresponding to the same physical state. This is the episte uh, psi epistemic case. And of course, we have to think of uh, uh, not only deterministic cases, but probabilistic cases. So to each psi, there will be a probability function. And um, the criterion would then be that if our model is psi-ontic, then there can be no two psi functions whose uh, uh, probability functions overlap, or that the su supports of the probability functions they stand for have a, an intersection. Where, whereas if we have an epistemic model, this situation is indeed possible, and we can have two psi functions whose probability distributions overlap, uh, um, and this is the criterion. Now, PBR come in, and they want to test um, uh, or, or to answer the question of whether, whether epistemic, uh, such epistemic models, where epistemic is understood along the lines of, of uh, Harrigan and Speckens, whether such epistemic models are in harmony with the predictions of quantum mechanics. And their conclusion, what they demonstrate, is 
that uh, they are not. Where am I with time? Okay. So before I get to their conclusion, let me uh, again bring Einstein into the picture. This letter that I quoted from Einstein to Popper, and also this is the same in the correspondence with Schrodinger. Uh, this is really the complaint that Einstein makes. He says, now it is unreasonable to assume that the physical state, and again, you have to think of an EPR um, situation with Alice and Bob, as we, Einstein didn't speak of Alice and Bob. Now it is unreasonable to assume that the physical state of B may depend upon some measurable, a measurement carried out upon system A. So uh, uh, this is no, no signaling if you want to, again, uh, which by now is separated from B, so that it no longer interacts with B. And this means that two different psi functions belong to one and the same physical state of B. That is, if we make ma one measurement at A, then we'll get, we are predicting, or we have one psi function to describe the situation at B. If we made another measurement at A, we have another psi function, but both belong to a real state at B, and this cannot be the case, according to Einstein. And since the complete description of a physical state must necessarily be unambiguous description apart from superfic <coughs> superficialities, such as units, choice of coordinates, etc. It is therefore not possible to regard the psi function as a complete description of the state of the system. So Einstein's conclusion is that exactly it's an epistemic state, but as I said before, epistemic state analogous to probability in statistical mechanics and analogies that he makes until very late in life, but in statistical mechanics we don't have this situation, right? We still have supervenience and here <coughs> We are deviating from supervenience. So here there is something unclear, I think, uh, to me about Einstein's critique. Or oh, maybe it was a deeper unclarity in his <laughs> thought about the distinction between psi-epistemic and psi-ontic. So PBR, is, uh, as I said, raised the question of whether psi-epistemic interpretation of a psi function is consistent with quantum mechanics. And there are no go theorem claims that it is not. So we don't have to repeat the, the proof. Uh, we have the paper. And uh, let's assume that the proof is OK. There are te technical issues that uh, one can attack. For example, um, uh, there is a, a paper, two papers by Schlossauer and Fine, who find uh, uh, technical problems with the proof. And I'm sure there are other people who joined in in the discussion. And so you can probably find some loopholes in the theorem and a more technical assumption that they make, certainly when they go from the case of two systems to the end system case, then th there is some uh, uh, problematic assumption there that they call preparation independence. But I think the more fundamental issue is, and here I think I uh, disagree with a, a, a common reading of a theorem, or maybe it's not, I, I didn't do the statistics, I don't know. It seemed to me that it is a common reading of the theorem that it really rules out an epistemic interpretation of quantum mechanics. But I think it only rules out one kind of epistemic interpretation of quantum mechanics. It rules out the interpretation of quantum mechanics that completes the fragmented sentence that I mentioned at the beginning, it is knowledge in inf and or information about the real state of the physical system. If it is knowledge and information about the real state of the physical system, then indeed, and if the theorem is correct, then uh, indeed you rule out a certain kind of epistemic interpretation. But what if we go epistemic all the way down, all the way up, and become radically epistemic, and we don't assume that there is a physical state prior to measurement, and we really uh, take the bookkeeping picture seriously. So in other words, if uh, Itamar or Jeffrey Bob or Christopher Fuchs come across the PBR theorem, uh, 
do they give up their epistemic view of quantum mechanics? So I think certainly not. So I think the real import of the PBR theorem is not a death blow to the epistemic interpretation of quantum mechanics, but to the contrary. It is a death blow to a certain kind of epistemic interpretation of quantum mechanics that makes it analogous to the probabilistic interpretation of statistical mechanics. But it pushes us in the more radical way of an epistemic interpretation that doesn't assume any real state of the system. Now this is, of course, I mean, we are moving to a more radical epistemic view. Uh, there is a price to pay. And there are problems. For example, uh, 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 Pitofsky and Bob make the analogy between this situation and the situation in uh, uh, special relativity, the kinematics, the Minkowski space-time. They think we don't need an, a, a, a deeper explanation. They say Hilbert space is a projective geometry, and it represents a non-Boolean event space, in which case uh, they are built in structural probabilistic constraints and correlation between events, just as, special relativ just as in special relativity, the geometry of Minkowski space-time represents spatial temporal constraints on events. And there are no further questions to be, to be asked. There is no further explanation. There is no deeper explanation for quantum mechanical phenomena, for quantum phenomena of interference and entanglement than that provided by the structure of Hilbert space, just as there is no deeper explanation for the relativistic phenomena of Lorentz contraction in time dilation uh, than that provided by the structure of Minkowski space-time. No further story to be told. Now, I think this is a bit too fast, um, uh, and I would uh, raise two questions. One, is this a perfect analogy? Along the lines that Denise raised before, according to the previous lecture, we have to look at the uh, uh, entire picture, and we had much clearer physical principles in the case of special relativity than we have in this case. Um, so I think this analogy is, is far from complete. And the second question is, can we actually derive quantum mechanics from information uh, theoretic principles? <coughs> so uh, in the case of uh, Pitofsky and Bab, they assume the Hilbert space. They don't uh, uh, pur purport to derive all quantum mechanics from information theoretic states. But others have tried to go that way. And uh, Speckens, again, has <coughs> built a beautiful toy model in which he assumes just this one thing about the level of ignorance is equal to the level of uh, knowledge that Schrodinger had anticipated in a way. And he derives a whole lot of results that match those of quantum mechanics, but not all of them, not Bell inequalities, not full quantum mechanics. So we are not there yet. And the last thing, of course, there is a philosophical price to pay for this radical <coughs> epistemic interpretations. Quantum states are not something out there in the external world, but it instead are expressions of information. Before there were people using quantum theory as a branch of physics, there were no quantum states. So this is a very high price, I think. Thank you very much. <laughs>
everything you said, uh, including your comments about BPR, which I think is uh, completely correct. I think it has been sold even to the large public for much more than uh, what it is. Um, the two comments are the following. First, uh, uh, one can uh, uh, give up the notion uh, that uh, the wave function or the Hilbert space uh, state uh, um, has an ontological significance uh, entirely. Um, keeping an ontology uh, which is just the result of the quantum events, the result of the quantum events. The original Heisenberg intuition that uh, the electron is something that manifests itself when it hits against something else. That's the core of the relational interpretation. I mean, the, the, you can describe the world as different uh, uh, subsystems when they interact, the quantum events. Um, that's what reality is about, according to the theory. And uh, um, the uh, wave function is a bookkeeping of previous interactions in the uh, bookkeeping of previous interactions. So it's just a way of, uh, rem and of course, a device for calculating the probability of future outcome of interactions. So this is a possibility. It's a it, it's it's an open way. It's certainly not ch challenged by BPR at all because, as you correctly pointed out, BPR starts with an assumption that there is a state. Okay. Now. <coughs> But the second comment I want to make is um, it's a content thing. Um, how would I put it? Pache uh, Kuhn, if I want to know a new theory, what is the meaning of something in the new theory, I just look at the limit in which the new theory gives the old theory, and I recognize it, what it is. I want to know what is mass. Yeah, if I want to know what is mass in special relativity, I just look at non-relativistic limit and say, ah, that's mass. Okay. Then there might be ambiguity and whatever. Now, if I take psi, Schrodinger psi, and I look at the classical limit or semi-classical limit, I see what it is, right? It is a Hamilton function. It is exponential of the Hamilton function, which is what? Uh, which is something that nobody would dream in classical mechanics to uh, weight with an ontological interpretation, okay? It's like giving an ontological interpretation to the Lagrangian or to the equation of motion. That's not, nobody would think about that. So quantum theory splits, has split in the way we learn in textbook, uh, uh, what we call state from the, 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 the quantum events, the manifestation, the, the outcome of the interactions, which are described by the eigenvalues of the, uh, of the operators. Uh, um, I'm with you entirely in uh, this uh, uh, idea that uh, the uh, possible route to uh, get out of the confusion is just to take away entirely ontological weight to this wave function, this this this, uh, this state, and uh, of course there is a weakening of reality if I, we think that the electron is something that only uh, happens uh, in certain moment in uh, uh, in space in time. But this weakening of reality it's uh, um, uh, sufficient to have a realistic or we we weaken weak realistic interpretation um, of the uh, of the world uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, a, 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 a full response to BPR is a fully open uh, way. Um, I never used uh, epistemic for describing, as you correctly said, epistemic might mean different things, right? If by epistemic we mean uh, the wave function does not have to be taken as a description of a real state of affairs, uh, then it is definitely epistemic or relational interpretation. Um, if by epistemic uh, we mean uh, uh, the theory only describe uh, the state of knowledge of humans, then no, I think one can have, one can, if one wants, one can still have a, 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 a more realistic view of reality, even without a quantum state interpreted realistically. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, about whether we can derive quantum mechanics. I didn't say we cannot, and, and uh, I, I'm just saying that in the re li recent literature there are attempts to go in that direction. They are not fully there as far as I know, but maybe in two years they will be fully there. So I was raising it as a question. Um, now, as I was preparing this talk, I changed my mind, and I, I think this is a part of the um, 
perhaps ambiguity uh, about the message of this talk, because I started out with thinking about all the difficulties that the epistemic interpretation has, and that uh, Alice and Bob are not in space-time, and it's all a probabilistic uh, um, um, constraint, or revolution in probability, but not a revolution in physics, or something like that. And I, I uh, starting from a re very critical point uh, against uh, this interpretation. So initially I thought I'm just criticizing the epistemic interpretation. And, and uh, the way I, I understood the PBR theorem in the beginning was the way that you say it was sold to everyone like uh, the death blow to the epistemic interpretation, so wonderful. Uh, but as I read uh, uh, the, the theorem, Again, it, it uh, appeared to me that that's not the case. So I was a little bit in the situation of the Prophet Bilam, who was called in to curse Israel and, <laughs> and uh, turned out blessing them, um, that I saw that there is a, a loop, or that there is a way out. And, and um, <clears throat> on the other end, it's not that I want to recommend this way out. I'm saying here is a problem. One certain intuitively clear epistemic interpretation is, I think, ruled out. Another one is very radical, and you can you can say I'm still a realist about the outcomes of measurement, but if you have to change your entire theory about a certain casino, all the things that worked before don't work anymore, then you would say the owner of this casino has changed the machine somehow, right? So if all of a sudden we cannot gamble anymore in the classical way, we have to gamble in the quantum way. We want to know what changed in reality. And somebody comes along and say, oh, well, from now on you have to, to update your probabilities according to a quantum algorithm and not according to a classical algorithm, it's hard to swallow without any physical explanation. So I'm really uh, with uh, Daniel and, and others who are trying to give us physical principles. Uh, for example, Peres, who was also uh, in favor of the, of the information theoretic interpretation, concludes a very, uh, a, a, an, an article where he advocated with the demand that we should find physical principles. Speckens himself said we should find principle, uh, physical principles. So yes, I think we should find physical principles. And if uh, I, I knew about your relational interpretation, but I didn't have time to read it, so I'm going to read it. And if it oh, is no, sorry. no <laughs> if it is epistemic in a, in in, a se in in that sense of not being about a real state, but not going radically subjective and saying that before humans came into the world there, was no, there were no quantum states or no quantum effects. If it, if it doesn't go that far, which to me seems absurd, like, like the Everett interpretation, or, um, then yeah, that's an option. Uh, I, in the meanwhile, the computer reacted, so I found the name. <laughs> the name is Philip Hohn. Mm -hmm. Now in perimeter, who has published uh, Philip Hearn, uh, Quantum Theory from Formational Interference Principles. It would Principle. be interesting if your computer may tell you that too, if he got Bell's inequalities, because <laughs> this is a stumbling block there. Just, uh, just maybe two short comments, uh, and just to say that I, 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 I think I certainly agree with, with your take on the PBR theorem, and I would even say uh, something more m maybe that, that you didn't say, is that I don't, I'm not even, well actually I don't really think that even the modest conclusion that, that, you, that you, you, you were willing to, to associate with the P P PBR theorem, namely that it rules out sort of classical epistemic interpretations or, or something like this. I don't even think that this is true, Th this m even weaker conclusion <laughs> is true, because in some sense, Bohm's interpretation is, is something like this, and PBR theorem doesn't rule it out, so... Yeah, so, so, so the, the only thing that they rule out is a very s sort of classical, I mean, some specific sort of classical uh, interpretation and, and that, that that and that's all I think. So it's even weaker than 
than than than than you, than you said. That's that's one thing. Yeah. So Which, let me let okay. me respond to this, and then we, if if the other comment is different, because yeah, the other comment okay. is related or is different, because yeah, I think. Um, Finance loss are make the point that if they are right, if PBR are right, um, um, it would be too good. It would be too radical, and they 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 uh, uh, detect and uh, well, they reconstruct the theorem in a way that it will be like a von Neumann theorem, and it will rule out any hidden variable <coughs> theories, and that's impossible, and so they detect a mistake that they think is analogous to the mistake that von Neumann made in his not So, yeah, so this, this it could be that there, are, there is a mistake in the theorem, but I was, even if the theorem is correct, then it's more yeah, limited yeah, than, yeah. than it is okay. to be. The other comment is just about this, uh, I mean, the interpretation of the quantum state or the, or the psi function that, that you were talking a lot about, uh, I think it, it's really the crucial thing. And that this is also related to, to Itamar Pitowski's view, which I, I mean, he was, re uh, and, and, and to your sort of more general uh, discussion about uh, uh, the relationship between the interpretation of psi and space-time, and, 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 and it's the following, if, if, we, if one goes in the direction of uh, interpreting Psi as some sort of a, of a bookkeeping uh, catalog of measurements, and uh, as Schrodinger uh, was talking about in the citation you gave, which, which was beautiful, uh, then I think, uh, uh, I mean, if, if that's the situation, then, then, then the next thing to do, which uh, I agree with you, one needs to tell a physical story about what's going on, but then, then there are many options, actually. Then you can, th then you can tell many stories. You can, you can tell the GRW story. You can tell it maybe even Bohm's story. If, if, but if we want a good story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but then, and this is why I think Itamar was uh, reluctant. I mean, I mean, for him it was more or less the last stop. Because there, there, I mean, the story. I mean, all all bets are off now, and we can we can tell many stories. And it's interesting, of course, to pursue this. But that's the that's I think that's how I see it. Yeah, I was thinking of Paul Correa, for example, when he when he said that uh, non-Euclidean geometry is also consistent in the world, not just mathematically speaking. So he bothered to give us a different physical laws and those that we have that would implement. So, of course, it was a toy model and it wasn't all the physics, that, but, but he showed how to do it in several cases. And here, we don't actually have that yet. We have various attempts, okay, GRW, but... Yeah, in relation so this to is still a very big challenge, I think. To okay. Thanks. That was really full of interesting things, um, particularly about Schrodinger. I think my my comment is uh, partly anticipated by by Myers, but you talked about the the price one has to pay for an epistemic interpretation, and uh, I would like to. S it, it seems to me that really there's some there's some heavy price to be paid for any interpretation of quantum mechanics, right? And the question is. You know, where should we locate, what are we willing to give up? Uh, it's, an ex it's an extreme step beyond any interpretation of quantum mechanics to take the view that, that Fuchs, for example, takes. But in the case of, say, uh, Petofsky and, and, and Bob, the way I understand that is this is an attempt at a kind of, the reason why they compare it to the case of Einstein and Minkowski is that they, they think this is one way of articulating what it is to be a sort of realistic about what quantum mechanics is telling us. It's telling us something about the world. It's telling us something peculiar about its structure. And what we have to give up is a certain assumption about the way in which <laughs> events are structured. And so the, the objection, well, we, we wish we had a, a kind of physical principle. Uh, it strikes me as analogous to an objection made by Lorentz to, to Einstein to the effect that, well, he's just assuming 
what we've struggled so hard to derive, in other words, to derive from physical principles. And the Einstein-Minkowski response to that was, at least implicitly as I see it, well, there's, there's an arbitrariness about the, the physical principles on which you've, you've derived what we're assuming. We're, we're not simply postulating it, we're recognizing it as the new feature of the world structure that these phenomena are teaching us. And, and that's the spirit in which at least I read uh, Petovsky and, and Bob. Yeah, I, it certainly is a spirit that they meant it, and they also, you know, uh, disagree with Bell on the point that you have to be able to give a physical account of measurement. But I think um, Bell's paper on how to teach special relativity is very instructive, because even if you think that fundamentally um, the, uh, the kinematic explanation of a Minkowski space-time is, is the most elegant and, as Denis said, also more uh, in harmony with the rest of physics, you should be able to answer questions such as if the thread breaks, and if it breaks, how does it come that it breaks? What tensions are there? What makes it break? And it, it, you can still think that the fundamental, you don't need the more fundamental questions in general, but you, you, I think you should be able to give an account in a specific case of what happens there. And it's the same with many mathematical principles. Um, uh, you can have universality, right, right, in phase transitions. But then they apply here and here and here. But you want to know why in the, ca in the case of magnets, how do they all reorient themselves at a certain point? And just telling you that it's mathematically the same case as in the water molecule doesn't help you because it want, you want to see how it works for magnets. So I think if somebody tells you in every measurement there is some loss of information, you want to know how it comes about. Let's say statistical mechanics, entropy. Some information is lost there if we take the, the informational interpretation of entropy, right? So information somehow is lost. So physicists ask themselves, at what stage exactly is this information lost? And the, the um, assumed assumption for many years was eraser. And Ollie wrote a paper and he said, no, it can't be an eraser. So I think it's one thing to, to say the general mathematical framework is this rather than that, rather than laboriously working like uh, Lawrence did, we now have Einstein. But then you want to know how entropy is erased in a particular process and how the phase transition occurs and how the thread breaks and how information is lost when you measure. But isn't that partly the question of how you pose the question? I mean, if I, if I don't assume that there is a state, as Schrodinger said, maybe I don't have to think about it in that way. Yeah, but, but then if I pose the other question, okay, well, so why does the string break, even though there are frames of reference in which it's still long enough? And that, if you if you put the question in that way, you wouldn't really think about it in the way that Bell did, but more in the way that Einstein and Minkowski would. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>